Uh, at uh, 3.45 this afternoon, uh, the uh, chairman of the Ontario Law Reform Commission will be uh, telling us about uh, some of the uh, recommendations that have been made uh, by his commission, and this is very timely. I understand there are three reports. The first report was just uh, uh, delivered this week, and the, the uh, one is to follow in the, uh, next week, I believe, and then uh, the third one uh, sometime after that. But in any event, uh, Professor McCamas will uh, be uh, reviewing uh, the recommendations that have been made uh, by the Commission, and uh, some of those recommendations touch on uh, what we've been discussing uh, yesterday and this morning, and we'll be discussing this afternoon and some other matters as well. Okay, I think we should uh, get started now with the uh, afternoon uh, program. Uh, income tax is uh, one of those other scary subjects uh, that uh, all of us, uh, well, speaking for myself, I should say, uh, get very nervous about, uh, especially uh, when it comes time to draft a separation agreement in anything that is uh, the least bit uh, complicated. Uh, to uh, provide us with a uh, checklist and uh, some uh, hints of how we can uh, go about this in a better way, I'm uh, pleased to introduce Mary Lou Benuto. Mary Lou. Thanks, Jim. Um, as Jim said, I'm here to talk about a a checklist for income tax purposes. If um, Bob McQuinney yesterday thought that his soothing voice was going to put you to sleep after lunch, this will really knock you out. <laughs> no question a checklist can be somewhat boring. However, it is useful. In preparing the checklist, I tried to consolidate the main items that should be considered when dealing with family law topics in settlement of affairs on separation and when you're dealing with a marriage contract. You can read it on your own and uh, put it on your bedside table in case you can't sleep. The balance of the paper, some 50 pages, really represents explanatory notes to the checklist. It will outline for you the substantive law on income tax. What I wish to do now is to highlight certain areas only, the areas that I think are important, either because of recent statutory or judicial development, or because it is an area that seems to breed misunderstanding. The first area I want to cover is a new development in the law that has to do with common law spouses. One of the more wide-sweeping changes made to the Income Tax Act this year is the amendment of subsections 252, 3, and 4. Those subsections expand the definition of spouse so that, as of last January, common law spouses are treated in the same manner as married spouses for all income tax purposes. The new legislation defines common law spouses as persons of the opposite sex cohabiting in a conjugal relationship and who cohabited throughout the preceding 12 months or are the parents of the same child. Note that the test does not coincide with provincial legislation, at least in Ontario, for determining support entitlement. The couple need only cohabit for a period of one year. This is a big change. And it's important change for common law spouses. It impacts support, <coughs> property, and tax benefits. With respect to support, firstly, the payments made for common law spouses, for, uh, between common law spouses, both for spousal support and for child support, with respect to separations that occurred after 1992, the payments are deductible without the necessity of a court order. Previously, a separation agreement was insufficient to allow the payer to deduct all the payments, and the payments were essentially net of tax. With respect to property, the attribution rules 
both income and capital gains now apply to common law spouses. This must be remembered when cohabitation agreements are drafted. Property can now be transferred between common law spouses without immediate tax consequences because the Section 73 rollover, which previously applied only to legally married spouses, is now available. If that occurs, you still have to remember that income earned on the property will, during the period of cohabitation, be attributed back to the transferor. Since the attribution rules apply, according to the Income Tax Act, both to spouses, and this includes common law spouses now, and to those who subsequently become spouses, the parties will be subject to these rules even if the transfer of property predates the cohabitation. To give you an example, if a woman transfers capital property to a man before they've cohabited for 12 months, after the 12 month period they will be deemed to be spouses under the Income Tax Act and all the income earned on the property will be attributed back to the woman who originally transferred it. The same rules apply to capital gains when the property is subsequently or is if the property is ultimately disposed of. That is, that the capital gains will be attributed back to the transferor woman. Thus, when you are drafting cohabitation agreements, you have to be aware that these provisions will apply so that unexpected tax consequences won't occur. The change in definition of spouse also impacts the principal residence rules. Common law spouses can now only own one principal residence between them for exemption purposes. No longer can they have separate residence, typically a house and a cottage, and claim the exemption for both. Next, the RRSP rules are impacted as a result of the change. The provisions for RRSPs that apply to common law spouses are now the same. This includes the spousal contributions and withdrawal rules, both during cohabitation and on separation. Furthermore, separating spouses can affect tax-free rollovers of the RSP as part of the division of their property on separation. And previously, these were only available to married spouses. I'm going to talk a bit more later about these RSP provisions. Lastly, the tax credits that were available to married persons, for example, the married status tax credit, are now available to common law spouses. So all of these provisions should be looked at and they're discussed in more detail in the paper whenever you're dealing with unmarried parties. I'll turn now and touch upon a few of the uh, developments with respect to alimony and support. There have been seemingly slight but very significant changes to sections 56 and 60 of the Income Tax Act, which alter the statutory requirements for deductibility and inclusion of support payments. Now, the requirements are set out as a list in my paper, and if it works, I'm going to try using this overhead. If, if you can't see it well, um, it, it, it is set out in the paper. And now, part of the difficulty I noticed last night with my paper is that the, uh, when, when it was transcribed into the gray book, my pages were renumbered, were renumbered and there was no corresponding adjustment to the table of contents. So it's a little bit difficult to find things. Uh, I, I realize that if you add five pages on to whatever page number in my table of contents, uh, you will end up at the right page. In any case, these are the statutory requirements. They are relatively straightforward and we've all seen them many times. <clears throat> 
Maintenance has not changed. The second and third, the spouses are living separate and apart at the time of the payment and for the balance of the year because of a breakdown of their marriage. This is new. Previously, the sections required that the spouses be living separate and apart, pursuant to a divorce, judicial separation, or written agreement. Thus, the parties had to be separated at the time the agreement was made. This eliminated the ability to provi provide for deductible support payments in a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement. Now, the test for deductibility and taxability of support payments is that the parties are living separate and apart because of a breakdown of the taxpayer's marriage. The payments still must be pursuant to a written agreement, but the parties do not have to be separated pursuant to the agreement. The result of this is that it's now possible to provide for deductibility of future support payments in a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement. Still dealing with this item, one of the requirements that's not new but that is, is, is often uh, problematic is that the spouses must be living separate and apart, and the emphasis is on living. Thus, payments made by an estate are not deductible or includable. The last point, payments must be to a spouse or a former spouse. Note that it does not include payments to children, which are not deductible. Likewise, if the payments are assigned to a provincial treasurer, which may be the case, if particularly if the recipient is in receipt of, of public assistance or welfare, there is no deduction because they are not paid to the estate. Remember that Section 56 and 60 of the, of the Income Tax Act is mandatory. If these requirements are met, the payments are taxable. You cannot make payments that otherwise qualify under these conditions. You cannot make those payments net of tax. Turn that off for a minute. The issue, this issue of, of payments being made net of tax, perhaps more than any other issue, demonstrates the fact that the interface of family law and income tax is not a comfortable one. We have a basic philosophical disparity in approach between family law practitioners and income tax enforcers. The former, uncomfortable with the rigidity of rules, believe that law is subject to an overall notion of fairness dependent upon the facts of the situation. Simply put, we really believe that we can talk ourselves out of most bad situations if the end result we seek is fair. Income tax enforcers do not see it this way. <laughs> In income tax law, rules are not guidelines. The intention of the parties is often irrelevant and certainly the ultimate fairness is completely irrelevant. Recent positions taken by Revenue Canada and supported by the courts demonstrate this time and time again. The Federal Court of Appeal recently in the Urichuk case emphasized that a taxpayer cannot contract out of the provisions of the Income Tax Act. In this case, the court was considering the distinctions between time-limited periodic payments and lump sum support payments payable in installments. Those two types of payments may look to all the world to be exactly the same. In this case, the husband who was making the payments agreed in writing to pay the wife, quote, maintenance, unquote, of $200,000 in installments. The court adopted the test that's been often quoted in the McKimmon case, which itemized the criteria 
for determining the nature of a payment when there is a series of payments. The criteria, which are lengthy and all set out in my paper, include such factors as whether the payments exceed the amounts necessary for the, to maintain the lifestyle of the recipient, whether the payments allow the recipient to accumulate capital, and so on. While the intent of the parties, if clearly ascertainable, is one of the criteria to determine, the court will look only at the true nature of the payment, even if it differs from that which the parties state. By simply calling a payment maintenance, the court will not allow the deductibility if other indicia of maintenance are not present. The bottom line is that if the payment is not for maintenance, but it is for a, a, a version of property, it will not be deducted. I mention this particular case now, both to talk about the law, but also to highlight for you the fact that the courts are repeatedly giving us the message that statutory requirements in the Income Tax Act are mandatory. Mr. Justice Hugeson in that case stated, and I quote, we specifically reject the appellant's suggestion that paragraphs 56 and 60 of the Income Tax Act are designed by Parliament to give an absolute right to separated or former spouses to contract into or out of taxation by their characterization of payments as maintenance. This type of same strict uh, requirement that the parties adhere to the, the, the wording of the statute pops up in other areas. It pops up in, with respect to third party payments. Now I have as well the outline of the statutory requirements for third party payments. Those appear in, in your book at um, page M19. Pay attention to the most often violated requirement here, and that is the second one on the list. If the sections are not referred to, there is no deduction. Note the last one as well. The payments cannot be made to allow the purchase of property other than medical or educational supplies. So be very careful if you're setting up third party payments that wherein the payor is making car payment, uh, car payments for the recipient or other such payments that can be tied into the acquisition of property, they may very well be disallowed. Please also note on your, uh, in your materials, I noticed as well last night, which is how I knew the pages were misnumbered, there is a typographical error. Point number two, the section of the act should be 56.1, not 56.2. There is no 56.2. And I apologize for that. Likewise, the same strict requirement applies with respect to prior payments for support. In order to take advantage of the provisions of sections 56.1 sub 3 of the Act to deduct payments made in the year of the agreement, you can just turn it off. To deduct payments made in the year of the agreement and in the preceding year, the wording of the order or agreement must specifically refer to the section and say that the payments are deemed to be made pursuant to it. A lot of us, again, because of the way we think as family law counsel, tend to take comfort in the fact that if something is embodied in a court order, we will achieve the intended result. Not so. Do not take comfort in the fact that your intended result is contained in a court order. 
Again, recent decisions have confirmed that whether or not a judge orders that a payment is taxable or not taxable, or net of tax or not net of tax, Revenue Canada doesn't care. The recent Manitoba case of Meltzer, both at trial and at appeal, dealt with this issue. Here, the trial judge ordered that payments made before the date of an interim order, some three years before the trial, be deducted by the husband. Revenue Canada said, wait a minute, that's not what the Income Tax Act says. We're not going to allow those deductions. The case went back to the trial judge, and the trial judge amended the order. The Court of Appeal said, on different grounds, you had no authority to amend the order. Once you made it, this wasn't a slip, therefore you cannot amend the order. But the Court of Appeal went on to say that they did not think that the judge had the jurisdiction in the first place to have made the order. Before leaving the, the topic of alimony, I, I want to touch as well on the issue of payments made both to and from non-residents. Canada and the United States have a tax treaty in place, so I'm going to deal with that separately. If there is no tax treaty in place, payments made to a non-resident are subject to withholding tax. This is the responsibility of the paying spouse. Payments from a non-resident are taxable if they are taxable in the source country. This is important, and it will, the importance of it will become evident in a minute when I show you the difference between Canada and the U.S. Now, Canada and the U.S. have a tax treaty so that withholding tax is eliminated. So if you have a paying spouse in Ontario making payments to a U.S. resident, you don't need to worry about withholding tax. You do for uh, most other jurisdictions. However, since spousal support is taxable in the U.S., but child support is not taxable. Child support payments to and from U.S. residents are tax-free. This results in the only known situation, or the only situation I've been able to find, where there can be a so-called double deduction. That is, the payment is, can be deductible and yet not correspondingly includable in income. This is demonstrated in um, a, a little chart that I've, I've prepared here. Now, this chart is not in your material, however, it is available. I have photocopies if you want to pick them up. They're at the desk outside. Child support payments paid by a Canadian to an American are not taxable to a U.S. recipient. That is because the payments in the U.S., according to their Internal Revenue Code, are not taxable. However, because Canada is the source country and we allow taxability, we allow deductibility, they are nonetheless deductible. All of the other scenarios on the chart are as you would expect there is a corresponding deductibility and includability in each one, except for that first one. And the reason is because the rules that govern taxability relate to the source country. Remember as well that withholding tax does not apply to any of these payments because of the treaty. And remember as well that because spousal support is taxable in both jurisdictions, is treated exactly the same. Okay, that's okay. I'm going to leave the whole issue of support and, and alimony and talk a bit uh, about property and try in, the, in the, the time that's left to highlight some issues. Remember that all spouses, and this includes common law spouses, 
can never avoid taxation on property transfers. All they can do is control the timing of the tax. Tax can be immediate if the election out of the Section 73 rollover is signed, or it can be deferred if the parties roll over property between them and agree that there will be, uh, or, or, or by doing so, acknowledge there will be a later attribution. This applies whether the couple is married happily or is negotiating a separation agreement. It does give a couple some ability for some intelligent tax planning. For example, if one party has unused, unused losses, he or she may wish to trigger an immediate capital gain. Conversely, if one has a substantial gain, it may be wise to transfer property for which a loss can be claimed. Often the one thing that warring spouses, either warring spouses or happily married spouses can agree upon is that they want to pay as little tax as possible. So that gives you some incentive to negotiate this. I mentioned earlier RSPs, and I want to highlight them because there seems to be some confusion with respect to the different rules applicable to RSPs, both during cohabitation, on separation, and on death. During cohabitation, spouses and now common law couples can deposit into spousal RSPs with no attribution back to the contributing spouse, provided that the titled spouse does not withdraw the funds for three years from the date of the deposit. That date of the deposit is the significant date. Distinguish between that year and the year, of uh, the year that the deduction is taken. Because contributions can be made up to the end of February of each year for the preceding year, the date of contribution or the year of contribution is most often a year later than the year that the deduction is taken. It is that latter year that starts the three years running. And many people have got caught by cashing in an RSP before that time. On separation, there are two separate issues that must be addressed. One is the withdrawal from the spousal plans. This can be done at any time, and there's no need to wait for three years. There's no need for a separation agreement. There does not need to be anything in writing. The spouses only need be living separate and apart by reason of marriage breakdown. The second issue is the transfer of plans between spouses. This rollover, which is part of a division of their property. To achieve this rollover, there must be a written separation agreement. It must be filed with Revenue Canada, and the transfer must relate to a division of property. If it is to settle some other right, such as arrears of support or a lump sum for future support, there can be no rollover. And lastly, on death, a person is deemed to have cashed in all their RSPs except for the portion that's rolled over to a surviving spouse. If there is no spouse, there are certain other dependents that are allowed under the Act that include uh, dependent children and dependent grandchildren. So you, you, you should look at that as well in terms of your estate planning. Now, in closing, I would like to leave you with a piece of advice that's been recently given to me. I think it's probably uh, particularly appropriate as you are on the last afternoon of two days of intensive learning, intensive listening, and probably in serious information overload. The advice, and it was given to me by a retired friend of mine on the back of a postcard from the south of France, <laughs> said, Mary Lou, just remember, no one ever died wishing he'd spent one more day in the office. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mary Lou. Uh, we are now going to get into uh, an area that, uh, as family law lawyers, we uh, don't often uh, think about uh, being involved in. And uh, this has to do with uh, family torts. Uh, in your uh, materials, you have uh, a comprehensive paper uh, on the question of uh, family torts that was prepared by Harvey Strasberg and Catherine McCurley. Now, they flipped a coin, and uh, Harvey lost and was uh, meant to, uh, well, uh, as a result of that toss, uh, to deliver the lecture today. But he conveniently uh, became ill. He was here yesterday looking very peaked and pallid, and this morning, uh, we found out that he had lost his voice entirely. <laughs> so uh, the uh, uh, toss came back to the uh, winner, and we are now going to hear from uh, Catherine McCurley on the uh, subject of uh, family torts uh, uh, delivered from the uh, joint paper that uh, they wrote. Well, Catherine? Well, the plan certainly was for Harvey to make the presentation. Uh, the plan changed just a couple hours ago. So in his last, uh, last words that he was able to utter, he, uh, <laughs> he mentioned to me that he was going to start with Cain and Abel. Um, I can only say that I'm not going to start at such a lofty spot. In polling the um, family law bar and in reviewing the reported cases in the area, two things, have, uh, two things are clear. The first is that tort claims are rarely ever asserted. The second is that in the few cases that proceed to judgment, the damage claims or the damages awarded are inordinately low. There would be several reasons for this. One certainly is that most lawyers and judges have been schooled in the regime of spousal immunity. Because it wasn't until 1978 that the bar to spousal torts in Ontario was abolished. And then eight short years later, the Family Law Act and the Divorce Act I think deflected emphasis away from spousal con conduct to the extent that many family law lawyers perhaps do not ask the right questions or listen to concerns presented by clients that would give rise to um, claims and torts. And it's only by exploring more thoroughly the conduct type issues that clients present that the will become aware of the factors that give rise to a claim in tort. I think quite often in the initial interviews we're focused in very quickly on the dollar and cent type issues and, for, and forget perhaps to ask the questions that need to be asked in terms of exploring conduct that gives rise for a tort claim. We also have to remember that um, some of this type of conduct is very um, sensitive and embarrassing to the clients and they're very reluctant to um, present it unless the direct question is asked. Although the, divorce, although the Divorce Act says that um, the court shall not take into consideration any misconduct of spouses in relation to the marriage when awarding support, that conduct should be examined quite closely because there, there are a number of areas in which tort can um, provide a remedy that otherwise wouldn't exist under the legislation um, in family situations. And I suspect that a number of us as family law lawyers aren't perhaps as familiar with the elements of tort that, as we should be. In the paper, we've attempted to outline in very skeletal, skeletal form a number of the torts. And I'm not going to review the elements of the torts now. What I'll just simply do is um, draw your attention to some situations that you might find uh, um, useful to or as a checklist for, for bringing claims in a family situation. Because there are lots of torts such as inducing breach of contract, conspiracy, intimidation, that I think are often overlooked in the spousal situations. The first um, tort that we've looked at in the paper is assault and battery, and I think that would be the one that would first come to mind for most people. In considering this tort, you should, everyone should um, take note of the two um, 1992 Supreme Court of Canada decisions which have been much publicized. 
the Norberg and Weinrib decision in which an elderly doctor exchanged um, drugs for sex with a woman who was addicted to painkillers, and also the um, case of MK and MH, which was involved a uh, father's incest with his daughter. Incest and the transmission of sexual diseases are a type of assault and battery, and, those, and we haven't dealt with them in any detail in the paper. Another tort that you might want to consider is false imprisonment, which undoubtedly may arise in a number of family situations, because it's arguable that not only um, physical restraint gives rise to false imprisonment, but also psychological restraint as well. And we've noted an Idaho case in the, in the paper in which a spouse um, sues another spouse for committing her to a, um, a mental institution. And there are lots of situations in which one spouse says that if you leave the house, you'll never see the children again. And if, you're, if the, the spouse who is presented with that stays as a result, they may have a claim for false imprisonment. And that's something I think that um, very few of us ever think of. One of the more, perhaps, mundane torts would be detinue and conversion. And this would, ha this would um, frequently arise where one spouse wrongfully detains, takes, uses, or sells chattels of the other spouse. And the claim should be given careful consideration, particularly in um, involving chattels where the value of the items is, has escalated highly, perhaps they're antiques, artwork, coins, um, even motor vehicles. And the claim for conversion should also be considered when one spouse forges the signature of another spouse, because if that money then disappears or leaves the jurisdiction, the claim can be brought against both the bank and the spouse, and that provides a right of recovery that might not be otherwise able to be enforced against just the spouse who had um, wrongfully forged the, the signature. <coughs> now, in considering negligence, the question in Donahue and Stevenson was, who then in law is my neighbor? Well, in the family law context, the answer to that question is quite simple. There's a duty of care owed to your spouse and the, ch and the children. There's no question, there's no threshold test, is this person my neighbor? There are a number of um, factual situations that could give rise to a claim in negligence, particularly um, where there are financial um, dealings and investment advice given, and also for the tr transmission of diseases by sexual contact. We've included a brief review of breach of fiduciary duty in the uh, paper. Breach of fiduciary duty is not a tort. It's an ex equitable cause of action. but. In situations where a spouse is also a doctor, lawyer, banker, stockbroker, accountant, should give some careful consideration to whether or not there's an overlapping of those duties, both as a professional and as a spouse, and the fact that there's a heightened duty toward the recipient spouse of that advice. You may have a, um, a spouse giving business advice, and that may give rise to a claim for breach of fiduciary duty and also give a rise for a claim in, in, in negligence. So I mentioned breach of fiduciary duty at this point because a number of the factors that give rise to the claims for tort also give, would give rise to a claim for breach of fiduciary duty. And that's, the breach of fiduciary duty is also considered in, in the two Supreme Court of Canada decisions. In conjunction with negligence um, is also a claim for nervous shock. Now, nervous shock is not an independent tort. It gives a right of recovery to a person who suffers a recognizable psychiatric condition as a result of a tort or wrong suffered by another. So, for example, if a husband assaults a wife, in the presence of the children of the marriage, and the child de develops emotional distress, the child may well have a cause of action against the husband for nervous shock. And that cause of action isn't dependent on the, the spouse or the mother asserting her cause of, cause of action for assault. The cause of action would also arise if the child 
wasn't present at the time of the assault, but saw the aftermath of the assault and developed um, emotional distress as a result of that. Likewise, if a child is physically or sexually abused by one parent, the other parent or the siblings may also have a cause, a cause of action for nervous shock. An action for intentional or negligent infliction of emotional distress is also available in many situations when assault may not be available. It's often said that words alone do not an assault make, that there must be accompanied by those words a physical action. Well, words alone that result in emotional distress are actionable. And there are a number of interesting American cases which recognize actions for intentional or negligent infliction of mental suffering in the context of, an, of a marriage. We've outlined some of them in the paper, and I'd refer you to um, page 16, the case of Massey, in Massey, a, a Texas case, where the husband orally abused and belittled the wife in front of the children. He had temper tantrums. Um, wouldn't permit his wife to write checks on the joint account, doled out meager sums of cash for the purchase of groceries, belittled her charitable activities, was rude to her friends, and as a result of this, she experienced an intense anxiety and fear. Well, quite often, those complaints are made, or if they're not made, we certainly should be asking whether that type of conduct um, is taking place in a marriage and considering pursuing that cause of action for the client. Because again, the problem is in the Family Law Act and in the Divorce Act, spousal conduct is not relevant in terms of a claim for support. Yet this may well have a great impact on the, um, the spouse who's the recipient of this type of conduct, their ability to um, continue to work or in, in fact obtain employment. There's a recently reported case of Bell Ginsburg and Ginsburg, which I'm sure you're all aware, um, which is a decision of Mr. Justice Rosenberg on a motion that the husband brought to strike out a claim because it did not assert a reasonable cause of action. And in that situation, the wife asserted that her husband's sexual activities um, put him in a high risk for contracting AIDS, and he deliberately concealed that the nature of those activities from her. In that situation, the motion to strike was not allowed. Not aware of any um, Canadian cases or Ontario cases that deal with um, the intentional infliction of, of emotional distress, but certainly that area isn't foreclosed and will no doubt be pursued um, with more vigor in the, in the near future. There are some other torts that should be considered when, particularly when spouses are involved in um, close in employment situations or closely held um, family corporations. And those are conspiracy, intimidation, and inducing breach of contract. You'll find that a lot of the causes of action overlap, and it's important before issuing the claim to explore the, the elements of the tort and the facts giving rise to the tort in, in your situation. Um, to ensure that all of the necessary facts are, are pleaded and that the, the claims are made under the various headings. The advantage, for example, um, in a conspiracy situation, and you can consider situations where spouses have transferred assets or created perhaps false or fictitious debts with the help of their um, business partners. The advantages are that if conspiracy is alleged, there's a right to discover each party. The damages are at large and not, not limited to the actual losses. And all parties are jointly and severally liable for the loss. And in addition, all the parties to the actions are, member are subject to punitive damages. And perhaps more importantly, as a preventative measure, if the business part partner is made a party to the action and is potentially liable for conspiracy, there's um, much less incentive for them to continue on in terms of the concealment and um, continue participating in, in that type of activity. Quite often in um, situations where one spouse is um, employing the other spouse in either a corporation or professional practice, we might make a claim for 
um, wrongful dismissal. We should also be looking at the tort of inducing breach of contract because unlike wrongful dismissal, the damages aren't limited to the notice period. The damages are, are at large again. In inducing breach of contract, there may be a situation where the spouse hasn't directly um, induced the breach but has acted in, in conjunction with others where you might be able to allege a conspiracy to, um, to induce a breach of contract. And if, there's, if one spouse succumbs to a threat to cause a breach of contract, um, there may also be a claim for intimidation as well. So it's very important to look at the different, the, um, the different torts to see how they interrelate and where you might not be successful in one, you may be successful on another. Um, intimidation, for example, um, will, will require different elements than inducing a breach of contract. And if, a con if conduct falls short of inducing breach of contract, you still may be successful in conspiracy. And I suggest that conspiracy is um, probably overlooked quite often and yet provides um, a wide ambit in terms of seeking relief not only from your spouse but the other people involved being the business partners. In looking at the cases, and again, I'm not going to, um, in view of the time, I'm not going to review um, the other torts listed in the paper. There's defamation, malicious prosecution, to name a few others. Um, the elements are there, and it's just, a, it's just a matter of being inventive and looking for situations with your clients to see where these would be available and to allow spouses to recover in situations where perhaps they're the conduct is not recognized in the spousal support awards or in property awards. Starting at page 39, we've prepared a damage summary. And the case cases are listed in chronological order. The cases that are shaded are motor vehicle cases, personal injury cases. The cases that are not shaded are in the family situation. And we've just tried to juxtapose the, the two areas to show that for simple whiplash injuries, the, um, the damages are much, much higher than in situations where a spouse has beaten another spouse. Um, if you look at even just the second case there, Fenwick and Staples, a 1977 decision, Damages of $1,500 were awarded when the husband maliciously made a malicious, unprovoked assault against his wife. He broke the door down, threatened to kill her, pushed her violently, and kicked her and rendered her unconscious. And yet, damages of $1,500 were awarded. In a um, whiplash injury, damages it's very rare to see damages less than $25,000. And what we've tried to do is do these in chronological, put, cite these cases in chronological order so you can compare the types of awards made and make estimates as to what they would be now in today's dollars. If you look at the 1983 decision of Cowan and Sugar, um, a woman was assaulted by her estranged common law husband and he bludgeoned her with a two by four. The damages there were $55,000 in general damages and yet that if there was a soft tissue issue, injury in a motor vehicle situation, um, certainly the damages are routinely higher than that. I'm not going to review the damages in any detail, um, except to point out that in the, um, at page 47, there was a 1991, um, personal injury decision where the male plaintiff suffered whiplash, the court found that he suffered chronic pain but exaggerated his symptoms, his depression was not directly attributable to the accident, and the evidence regarding his earnings was unreliable. But given, even given that, 
His total award was $162,000, which included $70,000 for, um, for general damages. And yet, um, if you look at the cases in the preceding page, Norberg and Weinrib, the Supreme Court of Canada decision where the woman was addicted to painkillers, her general damage award was $20,000. So I don't think that much more has to be said to show that the, there's a great dichotomy in terms of the awards, the damages awarded for um, personal injury in situations outside the spousal context. And one could also almost make the conclusion that conduct which is not tolerated between strangers is almost condoned in a family situation. In conclusion, I would just note that there are several impediments, I think, to bringing um, toward actions in the family context. One of them is that in the net family property calculations under the Family Law Act, the, um, although the damages, the right to damages for um, emotional distress are excluded, the tort fees are, um, has a right under the legislation to deduct the amount of the award under um, debts and other liabilities. Now, presumably, the courts would strain to, um, to make an award for unequal division. But again, that's at the court's dis discretion. And I think that there's a, um, uh, an opportunity overlooked in the Family Law Act and, and a gap there that doesn't allow the um, exclusion of the the damages, the potential um, damages to be paid by a tortfeasor um, should not be allowed to um, be a deduction from the tortfeasor's net family property. Because in effect, what it does is the victim has to subsidize the, that award to the extent of 50% in the net family property calculations. The other, um, the other two impediments, I think, to um, bringing tort actions between spouses are the awards for punitive damages. The courts are reluctant to, and, and in most cases, refuse to award punitive damages if there has been a pr criminal conviction. And quite often, the criminal process precedes the matrimonial action or the tort action. A spouse um, calls the police, lays charges, the Crown um, refuses to let the spouse drop the charges, the, the victim spouse um, is a participant in the proceedings but without any legal representation and the tortfeasor may be given a, um, you know, a week's uh, a conviction of a week in jail. But the problem is that then pre often precludes the uh, victim spouse from making a claim in punitive damages. And in situations where um, there's difficulty in leading evidence with wage loss. Punitive damages is, is, is an area, if you read the, um, the, even the short descriptions of the types of assaults in, the, in our damage summary, um, punitive damages are sorely lacking in that area. The other impediment would be that if the, if the law in Q and Minto is correct, a conviction for criminal assault is only prima facie proof in terms of liability in a tort action and not dispositive truth. And it's our submission that the law should be changed in that area and that a criminal conviction should be dispositive proof in a, in a um, civil action. Um, if it's not, what the effect is is that the victim spouse has to relive the entire um, incident and, ha and has to somehow establish that they weren't at fault or didn't provoke the attack. And I think that should be offensive as to public policy. Um, those are all my comments. I'm not sure what, what else Harvey would have said when he started with Cain and Abel, but um, I'll just leave it to your imagination. Uh, thank you, Catherine. I'm uh, sure uh, Harvey uh, could have done uh, no better. We thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to uh, break uh, for coffee and uh, then uh, come back to resume the afternoon uh, program uh, talking about uh, 
unmarried couples, same-sex relationships, and law reform. See you shortly.